So please turn with me to Psalms chapter 8. Come on, bro. We're going to jump right into it. Yes, sir. You know, for those who are visiting, we've been going through the book of Genesis. And now we're talking about back to Genesis, back to the garden. We're going to still continue going through Genesis this morning. Come on, bro. But here in Psalms chapter 8, give me amen when you're there. And if you don't have a Bible, please share with your neighbor. This is church. Amen. I don't want you to take my word for it. Right here in Psalm chapter 8, this verse really stood out to me when I was reading the Bible in verse 3. It says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. I love this passage because it talks about what God has done. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. This God created stars by just saying, let there be light. So out of his mouth comes stars. Wow. So all of these great things we see on the planet. But it says that right after that, it says, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. And I thought about that. I'm like, wow, God cares so much about mankind. Yeah. Come on. He creates a perfect planet that if we were any closer to the sun, we'd burn up. Any further away, we'd freeze. We're the only planet that has living water. We're actually, actually take care of our human being. And I thought about that like a lot of people think Christianity is man searching for God. The reality is true Christianity is God searching for man. God is looking. He is searching to see is there anybody on this planet that wants to have a relationship with with me. And that's the story from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Can mankind love God no matter what? Amen. And we're going to talk about a guy this morning who actually walked with God, right. who actually pleased God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Come on, bro. Take us back, bro. So, back in Genesis chapter 4, we're going to look at the story of Enoch this morning. So just like we learned last, last Sunday, you know, Adam and Eve made a bad decision that let sin into the world. And then from Adam and Eve, they gave birth to Cain and Abel. And we know the story of Cain and Abel. Abel, you know, brought a great, you know, sacrifice to God and really pleased God. But with Cain, he did not please God with his sacrifice. And Cain got angry. And you know what Cain did? He killed his brother Abel. The first murderer in the Bible. So before we get to chapter 5, let's look at chapter 4. So after Cain kills his brother, God's like, you know what? I'm going to banish you from my sight. You're going to be on this earth as a wanderer forever without me. But we learn about in Genesis chapter 4. Let's look at verse 13. Look how he responds to the punishment of God. He says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be a hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. And then it goes on and it shows the lineage of Cain. But what we sense, right, what we see right here in the beginning, his very first son, his name was Enoch. I didn't catch that before. Well, go to chapter 5 now. In chapter 5, let's look at verse... So this is the lineage of Seth. Seth would be the, the newborn out to replace Abel, the one Cain killed. So from Seth's lineage, look what comes up in number 7, his seventh generation. Let's look at verse 21. It says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and other sons and daughters. 
All together, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Interesting. So we have two Enochs in the Bible. I didn't catch that before. So Cain, had, his first son was Enoch. But in the Seth lineages, he was the seventh from Adam. And his name was Enoch as well. Well, then I was curious on what does Enoch actually mean? Well, I looked it up in the Hebrew, and the word Enoch actually means dedicated. So I thought about it. I'm like, okay, dedicated. Well, the first Enoch was not dedicated to God. He was dedicated to sin. The second Enoch was absolutely dedicated to God because that's what the Bible says. He'd walked with God for 300 years. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. It says that he walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Can you imagine? You wake up in the morning and you go to walk with God. You get your Bible out. You start reading. You're like, you know what? Let me go pray. And then all of a sudden, God just snatches you from this life. Where'd Sarah go? I haven't seen Sarah lately. What happened to Sarah? Levante, where'd Levante go? Because they started walking with God faithfully. 300 years. And we're going to dive into Enoch this morning, but when I learn about dedication, I'm like, all right, well, what's, that's the question for us this morning. What are we fully dedicated to this morning? Because you're either dedicated to walking with God or you're like Cain and you're going your own way. Because that was Cain's lineage. They didn't worship God. They worshiped themselves. They worshiped money. They worshiped success and what they could build. Like you said, Cain built this temple, this built this uh, city, and he named it after his son Enoch. There was no God in their life or in their lineage. But with Seth, he always brought people back to God and they walked faithfully with our God. And this morning, I look at the people that came here this morning to strengthen the relationship with God. And that's who we're going to learn from is Enoch. So the title of my lesson for you this morning is walk and talk like Enoch. Walk and talk like Enoch. I got two points for you this morning, then I'm going to sit down. My point number one is walk by faith, not by sight. My second point is Speak the truth in love. Wow. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to learn some things about Enoch this morning. But my first point is walk by faith, not by sight. Here in Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to see what is called the Hall of Faith chapter in the Bible, where it records all the incredible prophets and the people of God that actually, actually walked with God faithfully. And right here in Hebrews 11, we're going to learn the foundation of Enoch's walk with God. Because in order to really walk with God, you got to have faith. And faith is a matter of walking with God. So they go hand in hand. Let's look at Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance by what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Drop down to verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek after him. This is mind-blowing. Like, this guy Enoch was just another human being, just like you and I. But he made a decision, though, to turn to God and walk with God. Faithfully. This was Enoch's legacy. Can you imagine that be said about your legacy? As someone who pleased the maker, the creator, you please God. And it says that he walked with God for 300 years. So this guy was earnestly seeking God for 300 years. And it says, what happens if we earnestly seek after God? He says he rewards those. So think about it, us this morning. If we make a decision every day for the rest of our lives, who knows how many years we have in this life? Well, we make a decision 
to wake up early, to read our Bibles, and to pray, what are we telling God? We earnestly want to seek after him. We want to be close to him. We want to be like Enoch. Yeah. Yeah. And where are you going to end up when you die? Heaven. Because God rewards those who earnestly seek after him. And I thought about this, and you know, the, the saying, walk by faith, not by sight. That's exactly what 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5 says. It says, live by faith, not by sight. And for us, we cannot let our circumstances dictate our faith. See, we live in a world where people only want to go to God when it's going bad. Like, God, get me out of this situation, and I'll come to church. Come on, bro. And then you go to church that Sunday, then you stop going to church. You're inconsistent. Because your, your faith is dependent on your circumstances. God, I have no money. Please give me some money. God, I'm single. Please give me a girlfriend. So you start asking and begging God to give you everything that you want. Because you do not want to do life how you've been living. So you're begging to God, God, give me everything I want. And when you give me everything I want, I don't need you anymore. Because sadly, people only go to God is when they actually need something. Yeah. They try to cheat God like a genie, like it got three wishes. Like you get the Bible out and you have it read in a, like a blue moon, you like rub it like a lamp. Like, okay, God, you said in this one verse, you say, if I ask for anything, you'll give it to me. I'm asking. You're not giving it to me. You must not be real this morning. Sadly, that's the world we live in. If I don't see a miracle, I don't believe in God. You have eyes to see. You are the miracle. Like some people have a hard time viewing God for who he is. It takes more faith to be an atheist. Honestly, to come, the thing that we came from goo, like, are you kidding me? Like, read the Bible. It's there. But it says you've got to earnestly seek after him. But sadly, we live in a lazy generation where we don't want to open a book and find the answer for ourselves. How about just tell me what I want to hear, then I'll decide if I want to believe in it or not. But that's not who God is. God's not a God that give you something cheap, easy, and free. God will give you the best gifts, but you got to earnestly seek after him. I know for me, that's what it takes. When I actually sought after God with all my heart, was it easy? No. It was very painful. But I understood one principle, that I had to live by principles. I couldn't live by how I felt. You know, take your, like, imagine being in the army. I was talking to this young man earlier, and I was like, what if you told your sergeant, like, I don't feel like doing what you're telling me to do? It doesn't work like that. You don't think like that. Because why? When you go into the army, they got to put you through boot camp to get your mind ready to take on what you got to go through. The same way with God. God is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Sometimes we only view Jesus as a savior. If he's not your Lord of your life, he ain't your savior at all. And sadly, what people want to treat Jesus like this guy that he understands your heart and he cares how you live and like really doesn't care if however you live right or wrong because he understands you. Yes, he understands you, but he can also understand that you can change. But are you earnestly seeking after him? Are you living your life by faith or by what you see? Like, or how is your time with God? Is it dependent on just like, you know what? I'm not going to go by how I feel. God says I got to give him my whole heart. And I thought about when I got married to my lovely wife right here. When it comes to a relationship, you got to give your whole heart no matter what is going on. In a marriage, and I'm talking to some married people this morning, you're going to have what is called bumps down the road. Someone, <laughs> you can talk to my wife, you'll learn my sin real easily. Um, but in a marriage, we understand there's going to be bumps. But could you, but could you imagine? <laughs> I know Mark Clevin really wants to know those bumps. <laughs> oh, man. Maybe I'll give you one bump, all right? Uh, uh, but what I do learn is in a marriage, there's going to be, you know, it's not going to be always the honeymoon phase, you know? But could you imagine I didn't talk to my wife for more than a day? How do you think my wife's going to feel me giving her the cold shoulder? I know what she'll do. She'll definitely, she'll call Fernando. <laughs> hey, Fernando, Tyler's not being a Christian right now. <laughs> Amen. That's why you marry a disciple, because they tell you. 
If you want a successful marriage, you got to marry a disciple. But I thought about when it comes to our relationship with God. When we said, Jesus, Lord, we're like, all right, God, thick and thin. We're going we're gonna to do this together. But sadly, again, if you have the viewpoint, you're only asking for God for once. And, you know, instead of like, hey, God, how can I please you? Because that's not what Enoch did. He was a man that pleased God. It wasn't a man that, hey, give me everything I want and need. Some people just want all these things so I don't need God. But God's kind of like, I want to do life with you. I'm like, I want to give you the, the girlfriend, but your character's not there yet. I got to uh, gotta throw this harsh spirit away to kind of refine you a little bit more. I want to give you that job, but you're not disciplined in the mornings. You're always calling out of work. Like, how can I give you a better job? You say you want to graduate school, but you're not disciplined enough to study for your finals. And then you want to, and then you have the audacity to look at God saying, God, why am I failing class? You see, as human beings, we're very fickle, right? We, we, in our DNA, we really just want to be served. That's, where, that's our DNA. Because we're creating the likeness of God. So the part of us are like God, where we want to do our own thing, do what we want, when we want, then we'll be told what to do. Because that's what God is. You can't tell God what to do. And if we're creating that image, we can actually be like that. But God's like, there's only one God. And if God is not God of your life, then something else is, and it's not going to be good for you. And that's really the dependence of my life. I lived my life on what I could see. Not by faith. I didn't even know really what it meant to have faith. Growing up, I grew up going to church. You know, I went to a Baptist church. I went there every single Sunday. And I'm like, okay, this is not really changing my life. And I'd go home. I'm like, okay, okay. I intellectually believed in the message that Jesus died on the cross. I intellectually believed in that. But it had no transformation in my life. Even the people around me. Like, I have people that say they're Christians, but always at parties getting drunk sleeping around. What girl could I get next? I'm like, is this really what Christianity is all about? Is it just like a, a make it, you're a good person? But that's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is a lifestyle. And I had to learn what it really meant to be a Christian, especially in the 21st century. You know, look at the billboards, turn on the radio, look at any movies, man. It's sin everywhere. Like, how the heck am I supposed to live a God when I live in a fallen world? Okay, right here. It's the Bible. When you allow this to be in your life, that's when you can change. See, I appreciate Jet Dash when he's sharing his communion message. He was very vulnerable with his life. Like, dude, I used to be an atheist. Like, I didn't care about God. I actually made fun of Christians going to church. Like, you think that's going to save you? You think that's going to make your life better? And Dash even told him, like, when he became a Christian, like, dude, actually, Christianity is not about self-help. You know where you find self-help books? Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> Christianity may not help you, actually, at all. But it will get you to heaven. Come on. Come on. That's right. Did Christianity help Jesus at all? He died naked and penniless on the cross. But some of us want to be millionaires in this life. I don't see Jesus be actually going after being a millionaire. I, I'm not saying it's not, it's not bad to get, you know, get a job and a, you know, a house and a family. There's nothing wrong with that. But if, if that's your meaning to life, there's something wrong with that. It's only through the Bible you can learn how to have true faith. Faith is not just having an intellectual belief. Like, hey, I go to church every Sunday. I claim to be a Christian, but I have nothing else to say about that. Like, does your life actually match Jesus this morning? Like, you look at these nice banners right here. We have our theme scriptures in John 8. I've memorized that scripture so many times. To the Jews who believe, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, then you're really my disciple. Then you know the truth. So do the math. If I don't hold on to the teachings of Jesus, am I a disciple? No. What's a disciple? It's a student. Okay, if I'm a student at UH, I got to know the curriculum. I got to know what I'm studying. I can't claim to be a student if I didn't do all that to get into UH. Does that make sense? In the same way, Christianity is the same way. You got to hold on to Jesus' teachings. You got to know them first. And then you got to be a student, like, do I actually want to hold on to this? Because Jesus' life was not pretty. Yes, he did a lot of cool things, but he tells us to follow him and do what he did. And I looked at my life when I studied the Bible until I'm 13. That did not stack up. And one of the first things Jesus teaches is you got to hold on to the teachings by you got to go and actually meet people. you got to be fishers of men. Like your purpose of life is not working a nine-to-five job. 
It's not graduating school. It's actually learning how to take an individual, bring them to the Bible, and actually teach them the truth. If you don't know how to do that, how can you claim to be a student of Jesus? But then you just look at your life, and the Bible says in Luke 9, you got to deny yourself and carry your cross. Is your life full of sin or, or full of him? Think about it. Like, if you look at your life, can you honestly say you're a disciple based off the scriptures? But you know what the argument I always get when I share that? Bro, no one's going to be perfect. You know what that sounds like to me? An excuse. Not to give your whole heart to this. Because the reason is, in your DNA, you actually prefer pleasure rather than pain. Jesus lived a life full of pain. He was familiar with pain. As humans, we try to avoid pain. We try to avoid the tragedies in life, the health issues, and all that stuff. But that's not Christianity at all. Some people want their Christianity to be easy, cheap, and free. But that's not Christianity at all. If someone's telling you that stuff, they're selling you something. Because we got to live by faith, not by sight. we got to be a people that learn how to trust God despite whatever circumstance you're facing in your life. If you want to know more about that, what that looks like, read the book of Job. Job was a man, it says, word for word. If you look at Job 1, it says, this man, Job, was the greatest man of the East. It wasn't LeBron James. It wasn't the Dallas Cowboys. That one hurt. That one hurt. It was Job. Job was a man that had everything. He had the career. He had the fame. He had the fortune. He had people who looked at him like, man, he has the prestige. But you know what happened? Satan comes up to God. He's roaming throughout the earth looking for someone to devour. And God's like, have you tried my, have you considered my servant Job? Actually, oh, oh, you think Job's going to curse me? I created him. I know what's in his heart and mind right now. Go after him. Just don't kill him. So what do you think Satan does? He comes up with a great storm. He goes and he kills all his livestock. So there goes his job. Kills his whole family but his wife. Except for his wife. Well, why? Because his wife started cursing Job. Said, Job, just curse God and die. She lost faith. His friends started like poisoning him, saying, hey, you must have done something wrong for God to do this to you. Yeah. Because we live in a day and age where we're, if, we're going, if, we're, if our life is bad and we're going through hard times, we must have did something wrong. Or our parents before us did something wrong. That's not how God operates, though. How God operates is he disciplines according to our love, his love. The biggest stronger. See, God, Job was a good example on how to go through storms of life the right way. There's a right way to go through storms, and then there's a wrong way. But he had to teach them is by faith, not by sight, not by your circumstances. And it reminded me of a guy I, uh, I looked up uh, last night. His name is Charles Blondin. I don't know if anyone knew who that was. So Charles Blondin was a world-famous tightrope walker. You know, I'm pretty good at tightrope, you know? Not really. It says, early, early in 1859... 1859, I know we were there, around there. Blondin decided that he would be the first to walk a tightrope stretched across Niagara Falls. 1,000 feet long. 160 feet in the air. Can you imagine that? So you know what he did? So Charles was a great promoter, and he was a great entertainer. So he got a huge crowd to come watch him walk this tightrope. And he's like, so he gets the whole crowd. They're cheering, right? Some people are like, hey, I'm coming to cheer this guy on. Some are like, oh, I'll come and make fun of him. But then they want, and then other people are like, dude, I just want to be there to say I was there. Okay. So he gets there, and he's, he's getting the people hyped up. Like, do you guys believe I can walk this tight rope? Yeah. They're fired up. And like, all right. So do, do you know what he did? He walked a tight rope. He goes there, and he comes back. And people are like, what the heck? He has so much faith. Oh, my gosh. He's like, do you think I can do it again? He does it again. He does it four to five times. And people are just screaming and yelling. He's like, do you guys think I can walk this tightrope juggling these pins? Yeah, absolutely. We believe you can do it. So he's walking this tightrope juggling. Pretty cool, right? Like, why is he doing this? Because he wanted to do something radical in life. 
He wanted to leave his name. He wanted to have a legacy when people looked up on Google and say, oh, he's, he was uh, popular. You know, he was famous for doing something great in his life. But he's like, okay, all right, here's this thing. And he's like, all right, guys, I got another treat for you. You guys want to see it? They're, they're cheering. They're screaming. And then he unveils a wheelbarrow. Do you guys think I can move this wheelbarrow through the tightrope and come back? Who do you think you can? And everyone starts cheering, like, yeah, you can do it. So he does it. And everyone's so fired up. He's like, okay, okay, here's the next one. Do you actually think I can put someone in this wheelbarrow and go there and back? Like, yeah, you can do it. Who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? Silence. What happened to you guys is enthusiasm. Did they actually have true faith? No. That's not the case at all. I think that's how we view God. We only view God as this God that just gives me good things and he understands my heart. He don't expect anything from my life. But that's not God at all. Like, we got to be a people that are not so fickle. Like, when things are going good, give God the glory. But when things are going bad, stay close to God as well. Pray to God. Get fully devoted to him and trust him no matter what's going on. You got to get inside the wheelbarrow. Because Jesus is the one bringing you through that tightrope of life. But are you going to be the one to volunteer saying, you know what, Jesus, hear my send me. I want to follow you. I want to be a man that imitates you, that looks like you. When people see me, they see a true Christian, not a true hypocrite. But it all starts by making a decision. Do I want to walk with God? And you're probably thinking this morning, well, how do I really do that? Well, let's go to Psalms 119. In Psalms 119, this is the longest chapter in the Bible. So if you want to have a great quiet time, read this chapter. It may take you a couple days, but yeah. In Psalms 119, and let's look what it means to walk with God. Psalms 119, let's look at verse 33. Anakin, Anakin, I hear you, buddy. Psalms 119, let's look at verse 33. It says, look at what the writer is saying to God. He says, teach me, Lord, the way of your degrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statues and toward, not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread for your, law, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my life. See, the, the writer is trying to communicate with us on how we view God. We got to be a, have a heart that wants to learn. Like when we get into the Bible, we got to love learning it so we can live it out. The, the writer's like, give me understanding. So I may keep your law. So many people have read the Bible, but then I ask them, hey, what, what, what do you get out of the Bible? And they're like, man, I can't remember. Because they're, they're blinded. They don't really put the every effort to learn how to really live by the Bible. It says, direct me on how to obey your commands. Walk with me. It says, turn my eyes from worth of things. See, sadly, a lot of people rather actually sleep in than actually go worship God on a Sunday. Come on. Or they rather give money to like the next car instead of actually to God and help spread the gospel around the nations. Yeah. Some of us have our minds on worthless things, worthless idols that don't promise anything good. But we're so deceived that if I just get that one thing, then my life is meaningful. But God is saying right here through the scriptures, through the writer says, how I long for your precepts. How I long just to get to know you. See, when I studied the Bible, I was fearful because I thought this book right here is going to tell me what I cannot do. Like this thing is going to destroy my life. But then I realized that's not the case at all. It's actually God's love letter to a father to his kid. And when you learn how much God loves you, it should impact your heart. It should impact how you think. That God can actually take your negative thinking and give you positive thinking. That he can give you a hard heart, a heart that wants to be bitter 
and angry all the time and lonely and depress depression, he can renew that heart. Yeah. But again, it's, God meets you halfway. Like, if you have a little kid and you go in a grocery store and they run off like they usually do, and they go to, like, the toy section, are you going to leave your kid in the, the store? No, you're going to earnestly seek after your kid. That's how God is seeking after us this morning. He's looking. He's like, who really wants to know me? I know it's Kevin's birthday right now. And I know God has the perfect gift for him. It's praying and reading. Like really learning how to get closer to God takes a decision getting into this. And that's the one thing I had to really just like meditate on this morning as I was studying the Bible. It's like we got to be a people that have great faith. That we're not, you know, our faith isn't dictated by our circumstances. And on this past week, I know Vivian already announced it. There's, there's some great faith in our campus students. And we know we're raising special missions. Like, all right, we're just going to go to campus. We're going to sell candy and see what God's going to do. And they've already raised so much money. But what does it require? Great faith. You know, seeing the joy of Levante say, hey, man, I'm going to get more money than anybody. Watch this. And he just goes. He doesn't even think about it. Because why? That's what faith is. Faith is confidence. Say, you know what? I'm going to commit to God my plan. And I'm going to go for it. And he's going to answer or he's not. But at the end of the day, God is God. That's it. And that's what I see out of James as well. Nana, Levante, Vivian, they're all going after it, raising funds. It takes great faith. I think about Favor, who's donating blood and plasma. My lovely wife is donating plasma. It requires great faith. Not everybody wants to give plasma for missions. I got better things to do. That's the, that's the honest opinion. But when you don't know how to give missions, you find every way to see how can I do it. Yeah. Even myself, I'm going to give some plasma. Because yeah. I can't have my wife carry the load, amen? I got to lead the way. Yeah. But I want to encourage you this morning, inspire you this week. Do something that causes you to have great faith. Maybe it's that job you're trying to get, but you're just like, I don't know if God's going to answer that one. Go on faith. Apply to that job that you don't think you can get. Share your faith with many people. Get a Bible study set up. Who knows? The next person you share with could be the next baptized disciple. Amen. This week, though, I want to challenge you guys. Do something that causes you to have great faith. And then when you come here next Sunday, share that story. Just like we learned about Charles, that we remember him. And we're all walking a tightrope. What did we do this week that was radical for our great God? Amen. And that leads me to my second point. Speak the truth in love. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And in Ephesians chapter 4, we get this passage in verse 11. Give me amen when you're there. I know you're taking notes. I see you right now. <laughs> point number two, speak the truth in love. And in Ephesians 4, let's look at verse 11. It says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed." That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth as in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, 
which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. These are one of those passages where like, man, that's, uh, that's saying a lot right there. It talks about Paul writing to the disciples in Ephesus, saying, God, you know, he rearranged the body for a purpose. Like, he gave us the evangelists, you got the teachers, you got women's ministry leaders, you got Bible talk leaders, and you have all these different functions in the church. He did that for a reason, so that we could be fully mature. But it says, and how we do that is speaking the truth in love. When you speak the truth in love, it helps the church grow and mature. And that's one thing I had to learn as a disciple is we're going to have conversations where you're like, don't want to go there with somebody. Because we heard the saying, the truth hurts. So how many people do you think want to give the truth to people? Because why? They want to please people rather than God. But you don't know how to actually please people. How you actually please people is by delivering the truth in love. And think about it. Imagine in this room right here learns this principle where they're not afraid to tell people the truth, even when it's going to hurt them. That makes you a leader in God's kingdom. That, make, that helps us to be able to support the 100 disciples we're going to have here in Houston. But if you're afraid to tell someone the truth, you're crippling the church. Because timidity is a sign of spiritual immaturity. Timidity is a sign of spiritual immaturity. You need to hear that one more time. You just cannot be afraid to tell about talk about truthful things you know three things i think is really evident right now going on in the church is the first one is special missions if you go into a d time and you're afraid to talk about money with somebody what are you communicating with that person like they're like you know what okay they're you're not confident in what you're talking about like when i have people up here speaking like having matthew and vivian share about contribution they're confident what they're doing you can see it they're passionate about what they're giving to you gotta be able to be passionate with the person you decide. Like, hey, this is what we're giving to. We're not giving it to somebody because I have a Ferrari. Yeah. Nope. I've never owned a car really. When I got married, I have a blue Subaru now. It is what it is, you know. I've never owned a home, you know. I, I have an apartment with my wife in Midtown, and that's expensive. You know, there's clubs everywhere. I'm like, man, I don't want to be here. But nevertheless, there's people that need God. But when it comes to special missions. There's never an excuse why we would not hit it. So if you have people in your care that don't care and that they don't actually don't want to hit special missions or they don't have a plan to, there's something wrong with that person. So do you have the heart to tell that person, hey, bro, you're being greedy right now. Like you're not really loving God right now. Like God feels love when we actually give everything back to him. So when we get presented with a goal, does God expect you to hit the goal? He expects you to blow it out because who has the money? God does. But you got to make sure people's hearts are right. Yeah. Like Matthew said so effectively, it's like it's not about your wallet, it's about your heart. Yeah. When you understand why you do what you do, that's when it matters. Yeah. But you got to help communicate that with people that you see, oversee. Like, okay, does this person actually understand why we give back to God? Why do we give back to special missions? And if there's a problem, then, then we got something we got to talk with. Because in a family, is there such thing as a perfect family? No, there's always going to be some problems and hardships, but I don't know about your family when you grew up, but my family, we don't really talk about the, the elephant in the room. We just, we just let it sit there and watch Netflix. But in this family, we actually talk about the pain. We actually talk about the, the, the hardships. We talk about what's really going on in our hearts. If you have a funny feeling about special missions, get open about it. Don't allow it and bitter you saying, bro, I don't, you don't understand my life. I have all these bills. I can't hit this money. Well, bro, get open about that so I can actually encourage you with the scriptures and help you get a plan to hit your special missions. Don't just leave your brother in the dark saying, hey, bro, yeah, I'll get you. But you don't get, the, get the missions. Like, what, the, what are you doing? Like, be family. Yeah. Learn how to get back. Learn how to have a plan. Yeah. Like you have campus students raising money through selling candy. Yeah. I remember uh, Fernando's daughter, I think it was, Na it was a Nazi. Andrea, she sold, I think it was like donuts, and she raised over $100. Yeah. I'm like, if she can do that, how much more full-grown adults? Yeah. You know, but it's, it's all about the heart. Yeah. And this is what you got to teach when you disciple somebody. It's like you got to speak the truth in love. Or how about when your brother or sister is in, living in sin? 
Are you, do you have the boldness enough and the love in your heart to tell him, bro, you got to repent. Yeah. Sis, you got to repent. If you do not repent, the Bible says very clearly in Galatians 5, it says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Like, is it okay for your brother to be impure every single week? No. Is it okay for your sister to be impure every single week? No. So what do you expect God wants you to do? God's not going to come down in a flaming bush and tell that person. He expecting you to have the guts to tell the person to speak the truth in love. Yeah. But if you don't do that, what you're really saying is you don't care. Yeah. You really don't care about this person's salvation. Yeah. That you actually just gave birth to a Pharisee. Like you don't really care if people actually repent in this church. They would be just like every denominational church out there. We come to church on Sunday. We look good, but we leave living a different life. We have double lives. There's no power. Another one that we got to talk about is commitment. Yeah. You find people that are in a habit of missing the meetings of the body, whatever reason it may be. Yes, we got to do case by case scenario, but if it's somebody that's just oversleeping, like you got to get in there with that brother, like, bro, what's going on, man? This is the king we're serving. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't even miss your job for sleeping, but you think church is the reason to sleep on in? You, you don't understand, bro. Satan has deceived you. That's what sin does. It deceives you. It hardens your heart, makes your mind dark. So if you're having dark thoughts lately, because you're in sin. If you don't know your sin, maybe you got to get with a brother and sister and really check your own heart. Because the acts of the simple nature are obvious. See, when I, when I get a pre, when I've been preaching for a while now, I'm, I get comfortable up here and I look at people and I'm preaching. I know which one of y'all is in sin. But I guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to speak the truth in love because you're my brother. You're my sister. I'm not going to let any sin reign your life. If, if I have the power to get in there and to help you with your heart, I'm going to do it. And if you're going to hate me for it, then amen. They hate Jesus too. But I'm not scared of no man. I got to scare. I got to be scared of God. I fear God. And that's it. For us, though, if you're discipling somebody, you got to have the guts. Yeah. Christianity is all about guts and grit. It's not about pleasing people. It's about learning how to use the Bible and share it with somebody and call them to repent. You're not being mean. You're just literally being like Jesus. How many times did Jesus rebuke his own disciples? He called Peter Satan at one point. Like, you got to be family. You, gotta, you can't stop taking things so personally. Some of us got to learn how to have thicker skin. Like, some of you don't know how to take a correction. And the Bible says in Proverbs, you can't take a correction, you are stupid. It's not my words. It's not my words. It's the Bible. If you're not humble enough to take a correction, the Bible says you're stupid. And I'm like, sadly, that used to be me because I was a very stubborn person. But it wasn't after constant discipling where I'm like, all right, I get it. I'm going to do what the Bible says. All right. I remember the, the most... Uh, the incredible moment in my life where this really I lived out was back in 2013 uh, I was in Oregon and I was studying the Bible for the first time and for those you know I was at, and during this time I was engaged I was in a five-year relationship uh, had a house this is before Talia and I wasn't a Christian yet I was learning how to become a Christian and in this relationship, it was very unhealthy. It was very abusive. There was a lot of immorality and whatnot. And I didn't really, in my mind, I didn't really know if that was like wrong or right because I grew up in a, my, both my parents claimed to be Christian. And I saw them have many partners. So I'm like, oh, it must be fine, right? But again, are they the standard? No. No, this thing is. And the one thing, the book I was afraid of. So I remember in uh, 2013, I got with these guys. They studied the Bible with me. And the study they showed me was called discipleship. Show me what, this, what it takes to be a true disciple. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, it says give up everything. And he asked me, the brother asked me, his name was Jacob Bias. He's like, hey, bro, so what do you think I give up? And like many people are like, uh, I don't know, my time, I need to be committed. I just didn't know, right? But he's like, well, if Jesus came back right now and he looked at your heart, what's the one thing you do not want to give up? That's usually what it is. And then I still was like kind of thinking, and then there's a brother right here, his name is Bradley. He's like, what about your fiance? Oh. And then I'm like, then the wheel starts spinning. The brother shows me a scripture in Ephesians 5 that says, not even a hint of sexual immorality. And then I realized it says in Corinthians where you can't be yoked together with unbelievers. So I knew what the one thing was, was my, my relationship with my fiance. 
God did not support that relationship. I was doing it my way. I was doing the way of Cain. And I remember I broke down crying. And I'm like, it was the first time I cried. It was crazy. I didn't even know these guys. I'm crying because this thing was so powerful. It cut me. And I remember, and I told him, like, yeah, I, I know what I got to do. I remember going home, and I told my fiance, I'm like, all right, well, I'm moving out. She's like, what do you mean? We're getting married in, like, a month. I'm like, well, I got to start living for God. I've been not, I'm not leading you the right way. And I still want to get married, but we, you got to study the Bible. You got to start making Jesus Lord of your life. You got to become a Christian like me. And I remember she did not understand at all. And I didn't really put the two two together, but I was like, dude, I just want to get rid of God. And I remember that same day she drove me to my dad's house and I started living with my dad. And I'm like, then, you know, when you're like by yourself, you finally got the truth. and You're like, is this really the, is this really the truth? Right? And you know what started happening? The parable of the sower. The thorns started coming in. Satan's all coming in. He's like, let me just choke him on out. And then remember, what does the Bible say? When you hear the truth, where, where are you going to be tempted to go do? Go find other teachers to tell you what you, your itchies want to hear. So I wanted to find somebody to tell me it was okay to have sex with my fiance before getting married. So who do you think I'm wearing to? My daddy. Like my daddy goes to church every Sunday. And I'm expecting him to tell me what I want to hear. So I sit down and I'm struggling. I'm like, man, I, do, I think something's off. You know, this can't be the truth. I'm like, dad, how do you know this is the will of God? And, you know, expecting him to tell me what I want to hear, he does not. He's like, son, how about this? Let me ask you another question. What if it is the will of God, but you're just not accepting it? Oh. You know, I was... You could say I was so humbled. I was like baffled. I'm like, dang, I can't. God made it so clear. And I remember I'm like, you know what? All right, I'm just going to seek God with my whole heart. I gave up that relationship. And then I, on August 25th, 2013, I made Jesus Lord and got baptized. But I remember that was a game-changing moment. And a lot of people, sadly, they, they'll hear the truth. They'll find somebody that actually tells them what they want to hear. And you know what happens? They, they walk away from the truth. Yeah. They believe the lie. Think it's okay to live however you want. God doesn't, God doesn't care. No, God actually does care. He's a good father. He's not a father that abandons you and runs away. He actually disciplines you for your good. No matter how bad you fuss and fight, he's going to continue giving what you need until you repent and turn to him and get baptized to have a true relationship with him. But and I thought about this, you know, speaking the truth in love. There's another thing that stood out to me. Go back to Genesis. Um, I told you we got to talk about Enoch. I got to get back to him. In Genesis 5, something very, uh, what it really stood out to me when I read this, it says in verse 21, we're coming home for a landing. It says in uh, Genesis 5, look at verse 21 again. It says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Did you catch it? It says that at 65 years young, he had a son. But it says then he started walking with God. So he wasn't walking with God before that. Well, why do you think he had to start walking with God when he had a kid? Well, all the parents know why you need God in your life. I don't have any kids, but I understood the principle. Because... Who, how can you become a great father without learning from the master himself? So Enoch learned, how can I raise my son the right way? They lead him in the path that he needs to go. But then I, I started learning a little bit more about what this name Methuselah meant. And I, I looked it up. It, his, his, his son's name means, when he is dead, it shall come. And I thought about that. I'm like, what do you mean, it shall come? Well, if you look at the next chapter... You have, the, you have Noah come on the scene. Well, what was God going to send on the earth? The flood. He was going to wipe out all of mankind. So what does that imply? God told Enoch. He warned Enoch of the coming judgment. That he was going to raise his son in the right way. So when this, his son that lived like 900 and some years old, right when he died, you know what came? The flood. So before Noah started preaching to the lost, you know who did it first? Enoch. 
Well, go to Jude chapter 1. Right before, the, the book of Jude is right before Revelation. Let's look at Jude. There's only one chapter. And then, and Jude, let's look at verse 14. Come on, bro, preach. It says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is come with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness. And of all the fine words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. So this is who Enoch was. He was a preacher of righteousness. He's finding people on the planet who are talking bad about God. Talking bad about your maker. And he's warning us that, guys, the judgment is coming. See, Enoch knew Jesus was coming back one day wow. with the thousands upon thousands of angels. He said, if you don't repent of your wickedness and your evil desires, you're going to be wiped out. Wow. That's who Enoch was. On, Enoch was a preacher before Noah was. Wow. And he, did, he had the guts to speak the truth to people no matter what. Yep. For us this morning, we can't assume everyone's going to heaven. Yeah. You can't. Because right here, Enoch had to preach to the millions. Noah had to preach. The, all the disciples preached. You know what happened to the disciples in the first century? They all being killed for it. Yep. Paul was beheaded in Rome. The same year Peter was crucified upside down. Does your Christianity look like that or something else? Wow. We got to take this seriously when it comes to sharing our faith everywhere we go. Amen. Enoch had the guts to speak the truth in love. We cannot assume everyone's going to heaven. Yeah. Even in the Gospels, the people came up to Jesus and said, Hey, is only a few going to be saved? Well, let's go look at it. Go to Luke 13. Come on, bro. We can close out here. In Luke chapter 13, on, Luke 13, let's look at verse 22. Come on, bro. Luke 13, verse 22. It says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he'll answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you'll say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he replied, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evil doers. See, a lot of people don't view, they don't see this Jesus. Jesus has given us a clear glimpse of the future. It says only a few will be saved. He says to make every effort to get on the narrow path. Because the wide is the broad that leads to destruction. And many people enter that. But you know what stood out to me when I read this this time? He says in verse 25, he says, Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. See, Jesus is in heaven right now, sitting on his throne. And he says he's looking at the world, waiting for it to be evangelized again. It says once he sees every person has heard the message, he's going to get up, he's going to come back, pull everybody, and he's going to close the door. And then many people are going to be like, Jesus, like, open the door. Like, I believe in you. I, I, now I believe in you. But this is what, what I, I caught. It says, but he will answer, I don't know you. Or where you come from. So you never walked and talked with me. You weren't like Enoch who spent 300 years with me. Every single day, praying and reading and begging and pleading for more people to come to grips with the knowledge of the truth. Because Enoch, yeah, he walked with God faithfully, but what does that really look like? 
he was a preacher. He made every effort to get people on the narrow road. He wasn't just a man, a, a, a passerby, then walking people walk all the way to hell. No, he had the guts to speak the truth in love. Amen. That's who he was. I want to challenge those who are visiting this morning. This is a lesson where it either comfort you or it flat out disturbed you. But that's what happens to the Bible. The Bible is supposed to comfort those who are disturbed and it's supposed to disturb the comfortable. So if you're comfortable this morning and you feel disturbed, voila, that's God's word for you. I want to encourage you this morning. Study the Bible thoroughly. Stop going to many teachers. Some people like want to go to so many people. And what happens is you don't really learn anything. Like you got to learn how to live in this. See, we're part of a, a movement where we actually believe in living out the Bible. Does not know the Bible. Get with the person that brought you out and study the Bible. And make a decision to get right with God this week. If you don't know how to get right with God, then study the scriptures. Learn how it is. Because I remember in 2013, it was the greatest decision of my life. We got to be a people that talk and walk like Enoch. And God be all the glory.